Hey, I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'll take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to this kind of randomized version of Gun Rights in Texas, episode number 66. You can find the show notes, what little there will be, by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 066. Now, I'm not going to do a carry tip or any of that today because, well, I have no show notes. I have been very busy this week. I've got family coming down next week. Well, the week that you're going to be listening to this episode, I got family coming down. I'm going to be meeting with them. So at work, I've been getting ahead of my, well, basically getting ahead of the curve and where I'm supposed to be. That way, when I come back, I won't be too far behind. Now, I'm not taking a full week off. I'm taking a few days and I'm back at work and hopefully I won't be behind when I go back. However, the reason this is important is I... I haven't had time to actually put an honest to God, good episode together. And I figured why not just simply do a sit down and discussion on some of the things that I did during the week. Now, with that said, I'm going to run the audio clip on how to get the show and the audio clip where to find the show via social media. And then I'll come back and actually touch on the topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Okay, there's a little bit of a skip in that one. I apologize. It seems that the tablet has a mind of its own. I use a tablet for a soundboard simply because it gives me options that I don't normally see elsewhere. And this thing recently updated and it seems to ignore when I tell it to turn off the Wi-Fi. I don't know why. However, the audio clip to tell you how to find the show on social media is next. And then I'll come back and hit our topic. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Okay. Well, where to start? Today was the, my, technically, I guess you could say it's my first day of vacation time, but I spent a lot of time today helping out a friend and doing some other things. So, and this tablet is still giving me problems. I apologize on the quality on the Get Show and the social media audio clips but hey this is this is a seat of the pants episode with little to no planning so it's not going to get any polish one of the things i did was my friend he took his motorcycle in to have it serviced and get some parts added on and the the beautiful thing about it all is he needed somebody to give him a ride while his shop was while his bike was in the shop for a few hours Me being who I am, sure, I'll help you out. I run to Lubbock, I pick him up, and, well, suddenly things start clicking. We're going to gun shops. Now, if you'll remember, I went in and I had an interview with uh, a gentleman from Sharpshooters in Lubbock. And I don't remember what episode that was, but if you go back, you can find that in the show uh, notes and download the audio and listen to it. But we went into sharpshooters, looked at their inventory, rather nice. They have a wi- very wide selection of firearms. Then we checked out a few other places, including uh, Lubbock Shooters Group, which they're not in the same location anymore. It's been a little while since I've been in there, but they moved. They're still a class three dealer. They still have all kinds of shiny pretty things and 
you know, the store's kind of a upscale store. It's almost like walking into, well, to be perfectly honest, it's almost like walking into a high-end retail clothing shop. I mean, everything's on pretty displays and everything's nice and shiny and the floor kind, the floor, you could tell the floor is extremely clean, but there's something about the floor that makes your shoes kind of want to stick to it. And all I can come up with is they have that floor waxed so heavily and maybe they just waxed and the wax is soft, but everything in there shines. Everything in there almost seemingly has a protective coat. And to be perfectly honest, I kind of felt like I was too low class to be in there. I mean, it's a, it's a great gun short. I mean, it's a great gun shop. Don't get me wrong, but it's too pretty. It's too clean and it's too shiny. I know that might not make too much sense to some people, but I think the target audience or the target mar- market, blah, let me get my tongue untied here, is somebody besides me. I mean, they do have various holsters and they have, uh, they had, they have a selection of firearms, although they tend to, they tend to be the more expensive firearms, which isn't a problem for me. I didn't see any H and K's in there. Now that I think about it, I didn't see any H and K's at all anywhere in Lubbock. But anyways, I'm walking along. I'm looking at the various firearms. My buddy Ray's looking at all the stuff they've got. Most of this stuff, I'm just eh, no. I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. That's a gimmick. But it's overall, it's a very nice presentation. I think the best way to describe it is it's like walking up to a booth at a, at a trade show. That's really what the store looks like to me. A nice, heavily waxed floored booth at a trade show. It really is. That's the feeling you get going in there. Well, we leave there and we go down the road just a little bit further and we hit uh, West Texas military surplus. I don't know if that's still the name of the store, but that's what it used to be. And I think it still is. And that's a store that's more my style. They got a wide selection of firearms. He does CHL classes and he has a pretty good price on his classes. So I strongly recommend going in and talking to him. If you're looking to get your CHL or future license to carry. Um, if you're planning to get it and you're in Lubbock, go and check with him. I believe he's got two classes this month and three classes next month. He was saying great, friendly, great, friendly guy. The business has a very wide selection. You carry products from Sig Sauer on down to the well, Taurus and other lower priced products. But like I said, it's a wide selection. And there's not much I can say about it. It's it's not the bright shiny trade show booth feel. And it's more like the old school gun store feel. But then me and Ray decide, well, it's getting close to lunchtime. Let's go eat. Me and my buddy Ray, we run down and we hit a water burger. Now I know some people, well, they don't respect your Second Amendment rights. And no, actually they do. Water burger. Water burger has released the position that they don't mind you carrying a firearm in their store as long as it's concealed. They don't want to make their customers uncomfortable with open carry. And in all honesty, this is a, this is a good policy for moving forward. When open carry becomes more prevalent, 
and it's more normalized, maybe they'll revisit it and they'll open up where they don't mind you open carrying. But the truth of the matter is, if you're going to make their customers uncomfortable, they're going to ask you to leave. It doesn't matter if you're carrying a firearm, if you're wearing a shirt that shows somebody decapitating a cow, or whatever it is that you're doing, if you're doing something to make their customers feel uncomfortable and you're not in a protected class under the law, guess what? You're going to be asked to leave. Considering that, Whataburger could easily say, okay, we're just going to ban the carrying of firearms at all on our premises. But no. They don't want to be the they don't want to be the target of Bloomberg in regards to the issues that were facing Chili's and Sonic and I believe it was Wendy's or Burger King. One of those. They don't want to be the target of one of these groups like Moms Demand Action or Mayors Against uh illegal mayors against guns or whatever the group's name is. But they don't want to be the target of those groups because they're they're not exactly friendly to having a six figure media campaign being turned against them. No business wants that. And Whataburger is kind of like, well, you know, we don't want to make our customers uncomfortable either. So we're just going to, we're just not going to have open carry in our businesses. We'll allow concealed carry. And the same people that can legally open carry can legally conceal carry. So we're not banning anybody from being in our business. We're just saying, if you're going to, if you're going to come in here and you're going to sit and eat, then please carry concealed. Don't alarm our customers. Don't cause a scene. And that's not hard to understand. Do I think that they could do a better job on their gun policy? Yes. But I don't think that right now is the time to push it. So I'm sitting in there. I assume Ray's carrying. I'm carrying. We're sitting in Whataburger enjoying enjoying some great Texas food while enjoying our right to self-defense because we have our defensive tools with us. We finish up and we leave. I take Ray back to the gun, or not gun store, back to the Harley dealership. Take his old windshield that he's keeping and, uh, kind of hard to transport an extra windshield when you're on a motorcycle so his windshield's in my jeep i'll take it with me when i go to his house next time and deliver it to him but the point of the matter is i visited those gun stores ate at whataburger and i did it all without compromising any rights i did it all building connections, making friends. And you know what? I'm not, I didn't try to force any views down anybody's throat. Me and Ray discussed the Whataburger situation while we were eating. Nobody responded badly. A couple of guys at a table near us, uh, kind of had an interest in our conversation. And one of these guys was talking about how he was a member of the Lubbock chapter of Open Carry Texas. I mean, they were overhearing our conversation. We were overhearing theirs. And the the point of the matter is, I'm I'm sitting in Whataburger. I'm armed. I'm not in violation of any policies. I'm enjoying my food. The people around me are enjoying their food. And nobody is having a panic attack. And nobody's being made to feel uncomfortable. 
If somebody felt uncomfortable with our conversation, all they would have had to have done was say something and we would have changed our subject. Because when you're in public, you do have to make accommodations for those around you. Your rights end where theirs begin. Your right to keep and bear arms does not mean you can make somebody else a pack mule to carry your weapons for you. Just like their right to choose their religion doesn't mean they have to force their religion or lack thereof onto you. Nor are they allowed to. And that's really where we're, where we're going with this. Those who want to acclimate people, including law enforcement, to open carry when January 1st comes around, let me give you some advice. Avoid places where you're staying in one location for quite a while, okay? If you're going to be there in one spot in the time frame you're going to be sitting or standing in, say, that one area that's just a little bit bigger than your body. If the time frame that you're going to be in that space in this privately owned business is more than a few minutes, it might be best to check with the business and make sure they're okay with you openly carrying there. Because right now we don't want to throw it in people's faces. We don't want to force it down their throats. We want to acclimate them to it. You don't acclimate a saltwater fish to a freshwater tank by taking it out and throwing it right into it. You gradually adjust the salinity so that the water becomes less and less salient. And eventually you have that fish transition to where it's living in a freshwater environment. And that's what we have to do with with the ownership and the right to carry. We have to we have to transition people to it. They were transitioned away from it and now we gotta transition them to it. The point of the matter is if you're if you're going to go out and you're going to really advance gun rights, we've got two years to get everybody acclimated so that we can push further. In all honesty, I don't really see any push for unlicensed carry to be successful in the next session. It all hinges on how people react to open carry now. Our best bet may be, and this is just my opinion, but our best bet may be that we take and we run, I don't know, um, That was the best way to put it. Maybe maybe we take and we have a walk in the park. We let local law enforcement know, hey, we're going to be doing this walk through the park, and we're going to do a litter pickup, and we'll be openly carrying handguns. And then maybe we do a we do this thing where we see somebody on the side of the road with a flat tire. Maybe we pull over, ask them if they need help. If they say no, we go on our way. If they say yes, we offer to change their tire form. And we do this while we openly carry. This acclimates them to Hey, this is a good person. They're 
they're doing something good for me or they're doing something good for the community. And they're not trying to force me to look at them. They're not trying to force their gun rights down my throat. What I'm trying to say is, while we try to acclimate people to open carry, what we really need to do is be normal. Be normal and make open carry normal. That's how you acclimate people to it. You don't acclimate somebody to open carry by forcing them to look at a group of 15, 20 people, some men, some women, walking down the street with anarchy shirts and tattoos and um, legalized weed posters. And yeah, I'm talking about Corey Watkins there. However, at the same time, you don't acclimate people to something by leaving the status quo alone. You start out gradual and you, as you improve the conditions towards where you want them, you make larger and larger changes until you have everything you want. Now, we're not talking about making larger changes, say, to the effect of an exponential change. If you go to one place this time, you do two the next time, and then four the next time, and then eight the next time, and then 16, and then 32. That's exponential growth. You don't want to do that. You don't want to double or increase it in a manner that you're doing things too rapidly for people to adjust. You want to do something, and you want to get people to adjust to it, and then you want to move a little further and get them to adjust to it. And you move just a little bit more the next time. And a little bit more the next time. And in the end, your final step may be twice as much as your fifth or sixth step. But you have transitioned everybody to it. And they're used to it. And that's what we have to do. The reason that there was such a negative backlash to the open carry movement here in Texas. And people will say, well... Open carry Texas got open carry passed. No, they didn't. They tried to kill the bill that passed. They were telling their members oppose license carry. And they held that position right up until it, until the doctor came in, pronounced unlicensed carry dead. And then they transitioned over to, yeah, we we made this bill happen. No, they didn't. This is why I hate not having an outline to follow because I don't really have my points I want to hit lined out. But the, uh, and this is a hard thing to, to describe. Okay. Let's do this. I want to use an example of my Jeep. I drive a Jeep Wrangler. When I bought it, it had a hard top. When it came from the factory, it had both a hard and a soft top, but before I got it used, the soft top had disappeared. Now, personally, I love hopping in my Jeep with the doors off and the top off. I do hate driving in it when it's raining and I don't have a top in a, or doors. So I went out and I bought me a soft top. And then I really didn't like having the full doors. And I had a hard time finding half doors, so I bought some of the fabric doors. Yeah, they're noisy as all hell. Excuse the language, but they are. They're noisy. Going down the highway at 75 miles an hour, they let a lot of wind into the cab. But at the same time, I like them. You know, the first time I drove my Jeep, if it had been set up the way I drive it now, I wouldn't have bought it. 
It'd be too noisy. But I've acclimated myself to where I enjoy it set up the way it is. If the first time I drove it, it had been topless and doorless, I probably would have enjoyed it unless it was raining. And then I wouldn't have bought it. But I would also have known, hey, I can put the top and the doors on as long as they're where I can put them on. So, if I went out and I was going to buy a Jeep Wrangler as a daily driver and it had no top and no doors, I probably wouldn't do it. Simply because I would not, I would have no tolerance at all for the elements when it's cold or when it's wet or cold and wet. I would have no tolerance for that. Funny thing is, it gets into the 60s, and I'm still driving around with the top and the doors off. I wouldn't have bought it. I wouldn't even have thought about driving it like that when I bought it. But it doesn't bother me when, you know, falls here and temperatures are dropping. It doesn't bother me then. When I say drive it, I mean drive it to work, which is a 20-mile drive at highway speed, 75 miles an hour. It doesn't bother me because I've, I've grown acclimated to it. I wouldn't have enjoyed it when I bought it, and it might have caused me to change my plans on another vehicle. But I acclimated to it. And the way I acclimated to it, I take the top off. And I'd leave the doors on. And then I took the top and the doors off. And then me and a couple of friends, we left, uh, they left where I work, came to where I live. We all loaded up in my Jeep. We had my Jeep, my toolbox. We had my cooler and my first aid kit. And my cooler's probably three foot wide, foot and a half deep. It fits perfectly in the back of my Jeep with my toolbox and my first aid kit. Perfect fit. And my first aid kit's a 50 cal ammo can. But it fits in the back of my Jeep perfectly. And I got the unlimited, which means long wheelbase. But it's a it's an 06, which means it's a two-door, not a four-door. And we're driving... We get in the Jeep, no top, no doors, and to them it was a novelty. It was neat because they'd never ridden that far in it. And we drive, oh, four hours. We end up in Groom, Texas. We check out the giant cross right there just off the interstate. And we head back towards Amarillo. And we stop at the Bug Ranch, not the Cadillac Ranch, but the Bug Ranch. It's kind of a parody. And then we head back to where we live, where we live and work. Well, it was a novelty to them, but I had acclimated. At one point, they were complaining, "Hey, we need to slow down. This wind's bothering us." It didn't bother me. It didn't bother my buddy that. Uh, that rode with me a lot on where the top and the doors off. We both enjoyed it. The other two guys, not so much. But we had acclimated to it, and they hadn't. We were up in front where we had the windshield protecting us from a lot of that wind. They weren't. And what I'm getting at is, we were acclimated. And our position was different than theirs. When we're open carrying in public, we're acclimated to that. And our position is different than the family of three that's sitting over there with the three-year-old that just saw the movie where the bad guy used a gun. And now the kid's worried that These people that don't have uniforms may be bad guys. Well, 
because the kid's acting funny and acting up and mom's kind of like, well, you know, there's a man with a gun over there. Maybe I need to, maybe I need to be careful or maybe we need to go somewhere else. We don't want to do that. We don't want to put people in that uncomfortable position because when, when you, uh, when you do that, they're not going to support your position, but if you take and you position yourself so that the weapon's not quite as visible, you act normal, you're not walking around making sure you're uh, moving that hip with that pistol on it so that they look at it, kind of like the guy with the blue gun in the Capitol that got arrested. When you're not trying to make an issue out of what you're doing, then maybe, just maybe. Maybe you can be the one that goes out there and instead of making that family uncomfortable, you sit there, you eat your burger. They don't see your gun because you've positioned yourself where it's kind of concealed between you and the wall or maybe between you and someone else and they don't see your gun you get up you put your food up and as you're walking out they see the weapon and they think oh wow i never knew it was there that's a whole different reaction to it than when they're sitting there eating and they're wondering why has he got a gun Because to us, that's nothing to worry about. To a soccer mom who's read all the the material and literature that her pediatrician gives her that says guns are bad and that you have a 5 billion billion percent chance of a death in your family if you have a firearm in your home, this might not be a comfortable situation for her. But if you're sitting there, you're eating and you're acting normal and your, your weapon's not really visible until you leave. Guess what? You have done far more to acclimate her than sitting there eating and talking about going to the range or eating and talking about uh, well, if somebody breaks into your house, you can shoot them because yada, yada, yada. If you're not talking shop and you're acting like a normal person to them, and then you get up and as you're leaving, they notice you're armed. They accept it. And what you've done is you've acclimated them just a little bit more to the side of a firearm. Basically, They didn't see it. They didn't know it was there until you left. And now, all of a sudden, you're somebody normal that just, they just happened to notice was a little bit different than them, but you were okay. You've already established in their mind, you're okay. The problem with doing a march with a long gun is you can't make it seem normal you cannot be a normal person with a firearm that's visible to somebody because they have been decent they have been they have been conditioned to where the sight of a firearm means danger if you have a long gun and you're sitting there eating that long gun's going to be visible. There is danger present, and they don't want that. But if you're a normal person, you're sitting there eating, you're not talking about anything that might cause them to have red flags pop up, then you get up and leave, and you just happen to be armed. It makes a whole different impression. I'm repeating myself. So let me run the audio clip that tells you how to get in contact with me. 
and then I'll sign the show off and we'll wrap this episode up because you know what? I've rambled long enough without show notes. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Well, you may have heard some noise in the background. I am working on something. I told somebody I would bribe them to get their concealed handgun license. And I'm working on something to do just that. And I may talk about that later. But anyways, on my way home from Lubbock, I decided there was a gun store I hadn't seen or hadn't been in before in Brownfield, Texas. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to drop in and see what's going on there. Now, it's a, this is more like what I like to see in a gun store. Don't get me wrong. I like the nice, clean gun stores. I like the slightly less spit and polished gun stores. I love the gun store that's in the hardware store. But when you get right down to it, In my opinion, there's nothing better than a gun store that has the old general store feel. And in Brownfield, Texas, as you're heading south on Highway 385, and I think it's US 62 385, as you're heading south, you come across a business that's on the west side of the highway called Dan's Trade Lot. They have a sign out front that says gun store. And I got his card. His card has gun store, buy and sell, new and used guns, we do transfers, feed store, show supplies, farm supplies, Sono Ag dealers. I don't know much about the agriculture business. I live in I live and work in Gaines County, and I don't know much about the agriculture business, okay? I go to places where there's no agriculture. I probably know a lot. But here in Gaines County, I don't know that much. I couldn't tell you one brand name from another. But they have on here that they're located at 1697 U.S. Highway 385, Brownfield, Texas, 79316. I walk in there. It's got that old general store feel. I love it. You sit down. You can have a conversation. It's that general store feel. This is the kind of gun store I love to be in. I just thought I'd throw that out there because that was the other gun store I paid a visit to. And surprisingly, I didn't spend any money. I'm not sure how that happened. I did not spend money. But hey, all I can say is stay safe, carry responsibly, because episode 66 is signing off. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly.